it's something different to the mental game, something different to the technical game. It's looking at how can I bring the mind and the body into a relation with each other? Because the mind is usually for thinking. Think, analyze, process information. But the role of the body is to move, jumping, skiing, skipping, lifting weights, hitting a golf ball. The body wants to move. Immediately there's a dichotomy there, the thinking mind, the moving body, and they don't work together. The only way the mind can have any positive influence on the physical body in terms of delivering or releasing complex movement is to be quiet. And that all needs training, and, and that training, of course, we've talked about from Breathe Golf. Hi, this is Blair Sinclair from Irma, Alberta, Canada. I'm a proud member of the Alberta Golf Tour and play out of the Wainwright Golf Club in Wainwright, Alberta, Canada. This is Golf Smarter number 849. Connected Golf, bridging the gap between practice and performance with author Jane Story. This is Golf Smarter. Sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Jane. Hello, Fred. Uh, Thank you for inviting me back. Oh, my goodness. You needed to come back because I wanted to talk to you about Connected Golf, your latest book. Now, this is your fourth appearance um, on on Golf Smarter. You were uh, in uh, 2020, 2021, 2022. Uh, And if anybody needs to know, and I'll put these in the show notes, but episode 762, 794, and 843. Um, and you teased us last time with this book, Connected Golf. And I have to say, Jane, it works for me. Oh, good. That's good. I Did mean, you want to tell me how? Yeah, I do. Um, as I reported... I've suddenly become the interviewer, sorry. <laughs> no, yeah, don't do that. I don't like to be interviewed. But uh, okay. as the audience is well aware, because I reported on this uh, a couple of weeks ago... Um, yeah. I just shot the best round of my life and not just had a couple good shots. I shot a really great round of golf and I have to say that you were with me the whole time. Fantastic. Connected. Well, I hope you were with yourself. Yeah. I hope you really, you were with yourself the whole round. Well, I didn't get, I didn't allow myself to get in the way. It was the good good part. Yes, good. I didn't get in the way. That's good. But I'm telling you, ever since I have been working very hard on getting my feet grounded and, and, and feeling them and connecting with the ground, uh, I'm hitting the ball better, I'm hitting the ball where I want it, and I'm scoring better. It's amazing, isn't it, that some some very, very simple things, you know, done repetitively and consistently over time, create these outstanding results. And in fact, talking about the feet, I mean, this is what started me off on this path of bringing Tai Chi and the Eastern practices to golf. Because Jack Nicholas, he would have said that golf is played with the feet. Right. And Hogan, Ben Hogan, you know, with the archetypal golf swing, has said, you know, time and time again, it's there in all the books about the feet and the legs being the powerhouse of the swing. But what we have from Tai Chi, what I've hoped to convey in connected golf, is where on the feet should we balance? <laughs> yeah. Where where should we be balanced on the feet? And there are specific locations, aren't there, on the soles of the feet where we're more stable, more grounded, where the feet can really support the uh, the rest of the body. So that's that's fantastic. Hmm. Keep going. I'm list- I just want to listen. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk okay. about this book. <laughs> I yeah. need to talk well, about this book. I have yeah. so many places in the book that I've highlighted that I want to talk about, but I'd rather just have you uh, share it with us. Um, 
Uh, and like well, this one, yeah. this one thing here that you just said, and you just throw these things out there that to me jump out. It's like, remember, this is not a mental checklist that we were going over. Uh, you're preparing the body using simple and subtle physical actions that are proven to harmonize idea and action and to summon integrated movement by connecting to the higher intelligence of the body mind. Well, you know, when, when you read something like that, I'm, I am quite astounded that I could have written it. <laughs> uh, no, really, really, because it, it sort of comes from a deeper place than the mind. Mm-hmm. And it is humbling for me because I, I've only been able to write Breathe Golf and Connected Golf because I've done 30 odd years of practice. And we're talking, you know, formal meditation practice and Tai Chi practice. It's really touching because I, because I think, well, did I really, did I really write that? I mean, that's like, wow, that's amazing. Mm. But it's come from a place in me that's not the mind. It's not like, oh, I'm sitting on the freeway one day. I'm sitting on a train. I have this great idea about a book. It, it hasn't come about like that at all. doesn't feel that it's way. Come a, no, it's good. You know, it's come about through, I guess, insights and, you know, we could say, you know, received wisdom that's nothing to do with, with the mind as we understand it, but it's come from a deeper place, um, which is also why it's taken 10 years to write the book. Mm. But it's very interesting that there in, in the States, and you you know, we spoke about this earlier, I, I was very sad to lose my father from a stroke earlier this year. I'm so sorry. And yes, it, it's been awful, And but, but I, I believe he's now with my late mother, so mm. it's sort of a blessing. Yeah. But the reason I'm telling you that is because Connected Golf's been in the top 10 on Kindle in America since it came out, which was my mother's birthday, wow. which also happens to be Jack Nicholas's birthday, which was the 21st of January. But I've done no promotion, no marketing, no PR, I've done nothing apart from maybe send out a dozen tweets. And there's the book in the top 10. Wow. So it just goes to show that it's, touching something in people that they're not getting necessarily from the mainstream approach to, you know, top 10 tips on how to improve your golf swing. Uh, Yeah. Um, First of all, I have to say that your dad must be incredibly proud of you. Um, And I'm sorry for your loss. Um, Thank you. Sure. Um, But what's amazing is that it's a top 10 seller on Kindle Yet, it's it's people are buying it. Be, you know, maybe they're reading a sample. Hopefully, they're reading a sample. The name of the book itself is what is attractive to just get you there in the first place, which is connected golf, God. bridging the gap mm. between practice and performance. And it's something we've talked about so often. Is like you know, how do you take from the driving range to the golf course? How do you do that? Yes. And here's the thing that blows me away about all of this. You're not a golf instructor. You're not even a golfer, no, not. right? You're not even a golfer. <laughs> no, I'm not. And it's like, I'm not, but, but you, you connect know. it so well. You, you just, it's amazing how well you are able to translate your practices into effective golf management, if that's what I want to call it, well, golf management, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good. Um, well, thank you, thank you for that, Fred. But you see, I don't play golf, uh, but I but I teach golfers. But I don't always play tennis, but I teach tennis players. I can't snowboard, but I work with snowboarders and skiers. I'm not a triathlete, triathlete, but I work with triathletes. You know, I don't do equestrian or racing car driving, but I work with those athletes too. So, what's similar about all of those sports is complex movement whether it's the jump shot in basketball the tennis serve the golf swing a half pipe routine in snowboarding we're talking about the complex movement and from my background I've had this question of 
why is it, how come a, a golfer, let's narrow it to golf, how come a golfer can hit a beautiful drive when nobody's looking, and then as soon as people are looking, you know, he can't hit, excuse me, a cow's ass with a banjo, <laughs> you know? <laughs> It, how? Why is why is that? What's happening? And of course, everybody in in golf, apart from me, everybody in golf, all the technical instructors will say, well, it's because, you know, uh, Fred didn't keep his head down, or you know, he wasn't turning enough on his backswing, or you know, he didn't follow through properly, or his hands were too far ahead at impact. And, and what they'll do is they'll deconstruct the, mo the motion of the swing after the event. They'll look at it and say, this was wrong, that was wrong, this was wrong, that was wrong, and give you a checklist of things that you're meant to think about when you next swing the golf club to fix all those things. And, you know, I'm not criticizing anybody. I'm not, not saying anything that, other than that's just how it is here in the Western world especially in our frenetic society. There's the mind, the body's over there, and the two things never communicate with each other. And unfortunately, that is how we live. We live in the mind and tend to drag the body around with us. We're very rarely in the body, in the feet, in the breathing. But in the East, these Eastern practices are all about quietening the mind and having a sense and an, and an awareness of your physical body, the sensation of your limbs, the feeling of your feet on the ground, the awareness of the body's center of gravity, the feeling of yourself breathing, is very subtle and easily overridden by the, by the mind, the, the analytical mind. And when, when, the, when the golfer is more connected, when there's this inner connection. So you found it just by being aware of your feet. So you're aware of your feet, the mind is a little bit quieter, you've got better balance, you're more centered, more in the present moment, and wow, what a great golf shot. So it's this, it's something different to the mental game, something different to the technical game. It's looking at how can I bring the mind and the body into a relation with each other. Because the mind is usually for thinking. That's the role of the mind. Think, analyze, process information. But the role of the body is to move. We love movement, jumping, skiing, skipping, lifting weights, hitting a golf ball, walking in the park. We love the body wants to move. But Immediately, there's a dichotomy there, the thinking mind, the moving body, and, and they don't work together. They do not work together. Mm. The only way the mind can have any positive influence on the physical body in terms of delivering or releasing complex movement is to be quiet. And that all needs training, and, and that training, of course, we've talked about from Breathe Golf. Right, right. Listen, I need to take a quick time out for a sponsor, uh, but we'll be back right after this. This episode of the Golf Smarter Podcast is brought to you by MyGolfingStore.com, home of the Eagle Eye Rangefinder. Let's talk about the Eagle Eye Rangefinder. Actually, it's my favorite rangefinder, and it has all the premium features you need, like slope technology, an 800-yard range, and flagpole lock vibrating sensor. Yet it's a fraction of the cost of all the overpriced rangefinders out there. And it's so easy to use. Just raise the rangefinder to your eye and find the pin. The eagle eye will automatically lock onto the target, even like me if you have shaky hands. And then it will vibrate when the laser has locked onto the pin. I have to tell you, this is my favorite feature because over the years I've used a lot of different rangefinders and I've always had the same problem with each of them. I couldn't get a clear reading because my hands were shaking while I was trying to focus on it. With my Eagle Eye rangefinder, I just click once and it locks on the target every time. Now, here's the best part. 
Usually, the Eagle Eye Rangefinder retails for $259.97. However, we've put together a special 50% off deal for Golf Smarter listeners. That means you can get the Eagle Eye Rangefinder right now for the ridiculously low price of only $129. Just go to mygolfingstore.com slash golf smarter. Again, that's mygolfingstore.com slash golf smarter. Or click on the link at golfsmarter.com. And I'll also put the link in today's show notes. However, I do need to warn you that this is a limited time deal and it won't last long. So go to mygolfingstore.com slash golf smarter and secure your range finder why you still can. Jane, the amazing part about that phenomenal round of golf that I had was that I was not playing with people that I regularly play with. There were two gentlemen, two gentlemen there that I had just met at the first tee and were very entertaining and engaging the entire round. And uh-huh. uh, my playing partner was somebody who I've played with once before pre COVID and I've seen him around. I mean, we, you know, we're acquaintances, we're friends and know that we play golf. So it's like, Hey, you know, we bumped into each other and said, let's play. Okay, well let's play this week. So there was no pressure from my normal group of friends of performance. There was no analyzing. There was no looking over the shoulder of, Oh, I've seen you do that yeah. before. Uh, so I was very loose. I was um, very almost disconnected in a way from the performance of the round. So you were sort of free to experiment, really, and um, explore yeah, the training. Yeah, I don't know if I was experimenting. Um, no, it, I was free to, uh, to be within myself. As opposed to, you know, like, oh, I've seen you make that shot. Oh, I'm looking at you. Oh, I got to beat you on this whole type of thing. Um, Yeah. yeah, So it was, I was very um, internalized during the round and thinking about what I've been reading in Connected Golf um, and other, uh, other, you know, tips that I've had from Joe Perrin of Zen Golf, but also from... Uh, you know, like a swing mechanic from Josh Sander. I mean, you know, that's the beauty of being able to do this podcast is that I've I get Ugh, all these God, incredible yeah. lessons, and it's just this education. You should be the best golfer on the planet, Fred. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't even want to be on that level. I, I mean, it's like that. You know, I, I when I report. Interestingly, when I reported on the show about this round and I gave a lot of detail. I mean, I did a monologue for a number of minutes about this round of golf because it was so entertaining for me. And there were so many moments that were highlights it within two hours of publishing the show. I got an email from a listener who said, okay, you shot a 73. You are no longer allowed to be calling yourself a hacker. You know, yeah, because, quite right. you know, it's like, because that makes the rest of us want to be hackers if if you consider yourself a hacker. And my response was, look, as long as I don't get to practice every day and I don't get to play every day and I don't practice for hours every day, um, you know, get to play a couple times a week and maybe practice, mm. you know, I get to practice in my backyard with my putting and, and chipping, yeah. but not every day. And as long as I'm not dedicating myself every day, then yeah, I'm kind of still a hacker. I just had a great round of golf because yeah, I'm well it's... aware that it can change at any moment and I can be shooting in the high eighties or even in the nineties, which is for me well, the goal to stay away from, but that could happen. Yeah. But yeah, but, but, but this bridging the gap between practice and performance, mm-hmm. there are some very, very key and very simple things that you can do to try to not necessarily repeat the perfect shot, mm-hmm. but to, re- to try to recreate the conditions within yourself that allowed you to feel so free. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, if, if we sort of un- unpick that a little bit, most people in golf, they will focus on technique. But what 
what I'm trying to bring is to say, well, let's look at the condition of the golfer before, in the moments before they hit the ball. So if you, next time you go out, if you, especially if you did a little meditation or standing practice from, from connected golf, next time you go out, if you try again, when you set up over the ball, to be in your feet, aware of the feet, and suddenly the center of gravity drops, you know, there's not so much tension in the shoulders or in the chest. And from that one action, you're more grounded, you're more balanced, so you feel more comfortable, so you can relax a bit, so you can breathe a little bit deeper, so you're not in the stress response, so the, the muscles and the body can respond and move more freely. You know, we, we, mustn't, we mustn't undermine the power in these simple actions. I mean, if you go to the Shaolin Temple in China, have a look at the stone and the, the marble, stone concrete there that's been broken, cracked in half by the stamps made by the Shaolin monks, the Kung Fu monks, when they punch and they stamp on the, on the concrete. They split the concrete in half, mm -hmm. you know, because the center of gravity is low and there's so much power in the legs. And if we go back to Hogan and Nicholas, the golf swing comes from the ground upwards. All power, all movement comes from the ground upwards, even from the top of the backswing. It's from the ground upwards. So if you're in your feet, you're already more than halfway to a better, a better golf swing. Mm -hmm. But I think the trouble is that we're in this information age. Oh, well, let me look at this. Let me listen to that podcast. Let me watch that YouTube video. And we... We are almost in danger of overlooking the profundity and the simplicity of these, yeah, the profundity of these simple actions. Because another day, if you go out and you have no awareness whatsoever of your feet, you'll be a bit tighter in the body, mm -hmm. shoulders a bit tighter, shallow breathing, um, stress response, a little bit anxious. What does Joe think of me today? Oh God, I hope John doesn't start advising me on my grip again. You know, and you're in a, you're in a completely different you're in a different internal state. Right. Completely different. Biochemically, your your whole body's changed. So it's what you what you did. You can do it again. Absolutely. Well, it's interesting because the the uh, passage that I read a few minutes ago, um, the next line is, try to feel what's happening, or let me reread that, try to feel what's happening rather than thinking your way through it. That's right. That's and a, that, that's, a, that's a big one for me as well, is just, you know, get the feeling, but not try, not try to recreate the feeling. That's the hard part. It's like, okay, it worked then. I better kind of try to recreate that and do it again. I got to, you know, it's about being in that moment and being in that shot, not on that part it's of very, the scorecard. Yeah. It's very true. And, and this is why, I mean, when I work one-to-one -one with um, uh, golfers and other athletes, the biggest part of the training is is to practice formal meditation. So you're sitting there for 20 minutes, aware of the breathing, or you're standing, doing standing practice, which is integral or integral <laughs> to all the martial arts, standing still and be, becoming more keenly aware of your own body. Um, and then if you have this practice behind you, and of course you can do it yourself by, I've got uh, those two books and some um, performance products on my, on my website, so you can, you know, uh, train yourself at home. But then you've built up the discipline and you've built up some kind of awareness where you'll notice that, oh, I've disappeared into my head. I'm not in my feet anymore. Or you notice, oh, I didn't, that round didn't go so well, or those few holes didn't go so well because I was only thinking about deep breathing. I wasn't really, I wasn't really breathing deeply. So our society tends to feed only the mind. It feeds the mind 
with information, but we want to sort of feed another part of ourselves, which we can do in this practice of, of, of stillness and, and practice of silence. Hmm. I'm here. I'm just taking in the silence. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I do want to correct one thing that you said earlier because you're not a golf instructor, but I do want to suggest to you that instead of talking about hitting the ball, which you said when you hit the ball, I would use the, the phrase, make your swing. Because when you make your swing, okay. Yeah, because it's not about hitting the ball. Because a lot no. of people think that, that the, the end result is hitting the ball, but then they don't follow through, right? So well, it, it is yeah. a f- the full motion. <clears throat> it's making the swing. It's just not about hitting a ball, which is a no, hard one to explain to people yeah. who don't play. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're absolutely right. And the trouble, again, with the sort of the checklist approach to golf is because it's very upper body focused with sort of a a set checklist or menu of different positions that the golfers asked to steer their body into, it can end up that the end result is to hit the ball. Right. Which means that when the upper body is in control, the tendency is to decelerate. But if you apply the principles of connected golf where you're balanced in the feet, I've put these four fundamental actions in there emptying the chest, engaging the core, loading the legs, being fully balanced in the feet, so that your movement becomes a whole body movement. The upper body becomes soft, fluid, pliable, against a very, you know, in in opposition to a very strong and stable lower body. And then the ability to create a whip-like swing motion enables you to you know greatly increase your club head speed as you're almost you're spinning around an an immovable center which we would call the dantian or in from tai chi or in aikido the hara center and if you imagine these these masters when they throw somebody they're they're so rooted in their legs, but they're almost spinning around an invisible point deep within the lower abdomen. And therefore, the, the club head ex- accelerate. It has no choice but to accelerate through the ball. Hmm. Um, but, yes, thank you for picking me up on that. It, it wasn't what I meant. I understand. All right, we're going to take another time out. We'll be right back. Jane, you ha- this is your second or third book? Well, I think it's my fourth book, oh, actually. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, that's, that's okay. I wrote a book years ago, I think it was 2005, 2004, about Tai Chi called okay. Stillness in Motion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think it's on Amazon, but I've got a PDF copy if people want it. Um, and then it took me um, seven years to write Breathe Golf, then I wrote an ebook called The Practice of High Performance, which we spoke about on one of the podcasts. Mm-hmm. Um, that's an ebook which uh, you can get from me. Um, and that's for all athletes. So it's these performance practices for all, all sports. Um, I put together a 12 week mind body performance challenge when everybody was locked up. Um, <laughs> So that's how to apply these ancient principles to everything that you do as an athlete. And then uh, now Connected Golf. I've just done Connected Putting, which is an audio program, and that's me pretty much done with writing for the time being. (laughs) (laughs) For the time being. Um, For the time being, yeah. So what what do you see as the – let's contrast contrast, um, the difference between Breathe Golf and connected golf. Okay, well, from your perspective, there are two. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, well, what I'm bringing to golf is a performance practice, so based on these ancient disciplines, and the performance practice has two pillars or two sides to it. So, breathe golf is the first and most important pillar, 
This is to do with seated meditation practice. We might know that as Zen or Zazen. And the idea of a, a goal for practicing that is to learn to connect with their breathing, quieten the mind, control the biochemistry. And all of those things can be replicated on the golf course when you're under pressure. Mm -hmm. So the other side, of course, is about movement. So connected golf is, is about how to develop connected movement, how to move the body as a unit rather than segmenting the upper body into a set number of different positions. And I've even heard that some people have divided the golf swing into 100 different positions. So, you know, it gets, it goes from the sublime to the ridiculous, really. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but connected golf is, is looking at essential elements of the Eastern practices like Tai Chi and looking at how, how do we want to organize our body for golf? How do we want to train the golf body and indeed the body for snowboarding, skiing, tennis, whatever it might be? Um, and we, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but simply... It's that the upper and lower body must have different qualities. So you see a lot of a lot of the guys on tour, they're you know big, muscly, their body's tight, shoulders are up around their ears, and they they it's all about force and muscle and structure and and the body being being the whole body in one particular condition, whereas in Tai Chi, we want the upper body to be very empty, soft, and relaxed. But the lower body, the legs, to be really strong. Okay, and there's a beautiful phrase which says, stand like a mountain, move like a river. So immediately you've got these two almost conflicting qualities in the body which Connected Golf seeks to help you train. But what unites those two opposite qualities is the Dantian. Now, that's the center of gravity. So the center of gravity, if you imagine it like a golf ball down in the lower abdomen underneath the navel, just sitting about two thirds of the way in in front of the spine. And picture an Aikido or a Tai Chi master. They're rooted in their legs and they're moving around. The upper body is really fluid and it can move in any direction and it can catch an opponent and it can throw an opponent. So it's hard to explain, you know, on, on a call like this, but I've tried to, got an artist to try to illustrate this in connected golf, but it's about connected movement, fundamental movement principles and and the body, being able to appreciate the body as it moves in three dimensions from this pivot point or fulcrum of motion on the inside. Go on. <laughs> more? You want more? Oh, yes, absolutely. So there, Go on more. Yeah. I'm mesmerized. So there, so there you, <laughs> yes. So there, there are your two pillars. So Breathe Golf was the first book that I wrote. And, you know, I, I had... Um, I had sketches of these books going back to 2008. Mm. So this is how long it's been in my mind. Um, yeah, so Breathe Golf is your breathing, quiet mind, biochemistry, training that with formal meditation. Connected Golf is how do we, how do we train a golf body or sports body to be relaxed but athletic at the same time? And... It's been very interesting for me because because now I've now I've written these books and I've done my training all these years and my own life has changed so much. Mm. I've been very interested in going back before Tai Chi, like yoga or the Indian martial art of Kalari, Kalari Payata, which is supposed to be 3000 years old. And there are words in Sanskrit. There's two words. One is sthira and sukha. And, and they mean 
to have structure but stay relaxed. And we have the same the same qualities, the same understanding in Tai Chi, which comes after, you know, hundreds, thousands of years after these Indian practices. And it's all about the quality of sung, the Chinese Cantonese word sung, which means it it's structure or means to relax without losing structure. Mm. So it's very interesting. It's a whole other way of looking at the body as meditation is a whole other way of looking at the mind. It's to focus, but have a relaxed attention, a relaxed concentration. And here in the body, a relaxed athleticism, relaxed power. So it's completely different. And of course, the training is all there in both of the books for, you know, anybody who has the discipline or who wants to develop the discipline to be quiet. 20 minutes a day and it's a lot harder than you think it is so hard in fact that it's not something that appeals to me i i I, i've tried meditation um i find that i meditate better in golf and in the swimming pool to me swimming swimming to me is is a form of my meditation because there's movement involved but my mind is not distracted and it's only focused on getting to the other side of the pool and back well, it's great. I used to work a lot with um, master's level swimmers mm-hmm. uh, some time ago, and, and the two girls that women, they were always winning competitions once they once they were doing this practice. Mm. Because the Dam Tien is there, it's involved in the swimming stroke. Your swimming stroke is going to come from the center of the body. Yep. And if your mind and your breathing is in the center of the body, you're going to take less strokes to get from one side of the pool to the other. You're going to be faster. You're going to be more efficient in the water. But you can train it. If you don't like the thought of sitting quietly, there's a more active form of meditation, which is standing meditation. You could do that for five or ten minutes and then practice slow walking meditation. Hmm. But all the time, the mind needs to be there, back to the center of the body. But it's there in, it's there in swimming as it is in every sport. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One more time out, and we'll be back after this. This week on Golf Smarter Mulligans, in what originally was a members-only episode, which means that this is the first time it's ever been released publicly, we talked to John Adler, another performance coach, talking about spending more time correcting our minds instead of trying to correct our swing. My work with professionals revolves around their desire to perform and they emphasize too much the result aspect of the game. And consequently, they find that they can play very well away from the course. But when it comes to the actual day, their ability deserts them. Well, I would say that it's not their ability that deserts them. It's just their desire to play well or their fear of playing badly unbalances their mind. And the unbalancing of the mind leads to a loss of concentration And this loss of concentration is the cause for their poor swings and poor golf. But they will usually go round and round in circles looking for solutions to swing problems until eventually they realize that their game is they can't perform. But if people have an open mind and they're interested and they want to learn how to concentrate and focus their mind, then with patience and practice, they will get very good results. That's Golf Smarter Mulligans, episode number 165, featuring performance coach John Adler. Please, along with your subscription to Golf Smarter, subscribe to Golf Smarter Mulligans, the best of the Golf Smarter archives that are just no longer available anywhere. It's published every Friday from wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm now going to go back to that passage once again that I read to you. Um, oh. And the, the opening line of it was, this is not a mental checklist. But I want to go over this checklist because it's six points um, that I I'm, I'm find very helpful. And if you can walk us through it, do you know what I'm speaking about specifically? Do you want to tell me the page? Because I've got the book right here. Oh, I'm on a Kindle, so it says... Uh, let's see. I don't remember. It doesn't. Uh, oh boy, it just says stay here. Um, 
Oh, Don't worry, you talk me yeah, through it. I'm well, sure, I, okay, so sure I remember. Yeah, so first you're going to hold the club in the air parallel to the ground so that you can check your grip and alignment. Number two, sure. then you'll set the club head down, aim it towards the target, step in and line your feet. You know where uh-huh. I am now? You want to you wanna pick I it up do. from there? I'm trying to find it. Okay. You carry on for the t- time being. Sure. Number three, <laughs> as you do this, exhale slowly. And this oh, has been a big it. part. Yeah. yeah. Slowly while you simultaneously apply the four fundamental actions. And those are the ones that I want to talk about, those four fundamental actions. But Yeah, let, sure. Let's go ahead and do that. Yes, okay. So this is in chapter chapter 10 in the book which is chapter 10, I can't even remember, I'll look it up. <laughs> yes, it's called The Connected Setup. Okay, yeah. It's called The Connected Setup. So it's just quite a useful way to begin to apply the four fundamentals. So if I tell you what those are first. Please. So I'll just tell you sort of briefly, but um, yeah, people can read about them uh, if they want to. So we talked earlier about this, the upper and lower body having two different qualities. So the upper body needs to be soft and we need to get down in the legs and in the feet. So we can do that quite simply by standing up, especially if you do your standing meditation practice, you'll be learning this and drilling it every day. But the four fundamental actions are empty the chest. Bring your mind and your breathing to the navel so you engage the core slightly. Emptying the chest and engaging the core has the effect of relaxing the upper body so that you can load the legs. And by that, I mean your legs are now supporting the upper body, which is more relaxed. And you're going to find that balance point on the feet, which is the front inside part of the heel. It matches the end of the tibia bone which runs down the inside of the lower leg, the job of which is to support 90% of your body weight. So that's it simply, but they need practicing, they need drilling, you've got to do your training, and then when you're standing over the ball, you can apply them. So it became something that my students fed back to me, that the tendency and the habit is to, to immediately hinge and set up to the ball with the the bum sticking out and your chest forward um, to immediately do that. And I want people to settle into their body. So you stand up straight, hold the club out in front of you, check your grip, check your alignment. And then as you slowly place the club down on the floor, your energy in your body is going to follow that. So you're going to breathe out, empty the chest, engage the center, load the legs in the balance point. And all of those things quieten the mind, steady the adrenaline, you know, control the nerves and the anxiety, and switch the body on. Body's got to be switched on so that it, it's primed to respond to the intention you then have for the shot. Was that any good, Fred? Mm-hmm. Very, <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> very good. <laughs> yeah, but it's not it's not a mental checklist, but you have to no. practice and practice and practice it like you do anything. Right. And then it becomes more internal. Um, and I always point to Bruce Lee, if people uh, remember Bruce Lee, if you're old enough to remember sure. Bruce Lee. Sure. Um, yeah, if you, if you watch Bruce Lee when he's getting ready to fight the opponent he he kind of crunches down into his body doesn't he you can see him sort of wiggling his uh uh, his shoulders and his chest and he kind of sinks down into the body or if you watch the karate kid movies you know that they sink down don't they into the body upper body's then free to to respond so it's part of really switching on the ability to have the body respond to your intention. Hmm. And but it needs training, you know. It does. It does. But so do your does training, golf. Fred. Do your training. Yeah. <laughs> but here, here's what I want to emphasize to to golfers everywhere: is that 
you can go to the range and pound balls all day long, and you can really focus on uh, on on your swing technique, but you may not see the progress that you're looking for and you'll be confused about it. And to me, there's a couple of things missing when all you're doing is focusing on trying to strike the ball better. One is when you're on the golf course, you have to learn how to play a golf course. They call it course management, you know, in different situations, different shots. If you listen, when we had uh, Rick Sessinghouse, which is Colin Morikawa's coach. He talked about how when, when, when he was training Colin since the age of eight, he was always doing, dropping multiple balls in different spots and go, okay, how many different ways can you play this shot, mm. right? Mm. So there, there is the course management element of it and learning how to play a golf course. And then there is this part of it, the centering part, the mental part, the emotional part of it that will also help you not worry about your score, not look at your scorecard, not get caught up in the mistakes and not hearing yourself going, I always hit the ball in the water here and not hearing Mm. yourself say, oh, well, this day is going to be shot. I can already feel it. It, it, You know, there's so many more elements than just striking a golf ball to have lower scores and to achieve what your, your goals are. If you have goals, um, and you may not, you may just want to go out and have fun, go for it, do it. But if you're listening to the podcast, I have a feeling you want a little bit more <laughs> of it than just well, it, striking yes, and, the ball. And, and also people want more enjoyment and less frustration out there. Right. And, you know, what I would say is, you know, give these performance practices a go. There's a lot of work, a lot of research, a lot of effort gone into bringing them to you. But they are to support and provide a foundation for your technique. Mm-hmm. Your, your technique's no good. You can have the best swing in the world, but if you're not balanced, if you're not relaxed, if you're agitated, if you're in the stress stress response, if you're thinking too much, that perfect swing from the range is not going to be transferable to the golf course. Right. You know, in the martial arts, you don't give somebody a sword or a, or a joe, a short stick, to, to wield about on their first, first class or their first lesson. You know, you learn over a period of years in a focus, quiet, preparation. And that comes before movement. And it's this element that's been missing from, from golf that, I, that I, I hope I'm, you know, filling that gap. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, the book is called Connected Golf, Bridging the Gap Between Practice and Performance. And there's also Breathe Golf, which we've talked about on previous episodes. And Jane, please share with us the website. And you, if you want people to reach out to you to have conversations or ask questions, how can we do that? Yes, of course. I'm happy to hear from anybody who wants to do this practice. Um, it's not really a job for me. It's a, a vocation and a real labor of love. So, you know, do reach out if you want to get going with the seated or standing meditation. Um, my website at the moment is Chi Performance. So it's chi-performance.com. So Chi is the Chinese word for energy or the breath. So it's Chi, chi-performance.com. Um, There's a couple of things you can do on that site. One is I've just brought out Connected Putting, and there's a huge discount on that at the moment. Uh, And if you get that and you send me a quick email and say that you've heard me talking to Fred, I'll send you all the bonuses. I've written three bonus worksheets, one on chipping, an introduction to your performance practice, and something else that I can't remember but I'll send them all to you. (laughs) And the other thing is um, I have a free report called Zen Mind Sports Mind. So if you just want to dip your toe in the water and have a little practice of formal meditation, you just sign up for the newsletter and I'll send you that free of charge. Very kind, very generous. Jane, always, always fascinating to talk to you. I really appreciate the work you're doing. Thanks so much for joining us today. 
Thank you very much, Fred. Thanks to Blair Sinclair of Irma, Canada, our newest Golf Smarter ambassador. Uh, you can get a sleeve of golf balls with the Golf Smarter logo. You can get the Tony Manzoni video or receive a new glove and glove storage compartment from RedRoosterGolf.com when that actually they have 11 styles to choose from and gloves with 26 different sizes so you're sure they're going to fit properly and you are going to enjoy this glove, and you're going to enjoy the choices, too. We thank Red Rooster Golf for offering a new glove to our Golf Smarter ambassadors. So why don't you join the team and win a prize just for leaving a voicemail? What voicemail are we talking about? It's doing the show opening that you hear every week here on Golf Smarter. Write to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com or click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com and let me know that you'd like to do an episode intro and I'll send you some really simple instructions so you can win that prize. Now, I want to do a quick follow-up to our last episode where I reported my greatest round ever. As I said... I'm well aware that these incredible rounds don't come in bunches and definitely don't come often. It's it's just knowing that scores like this are possible and they do live in my bag, which is probably why we all keep coming back again and again and again. So within an hour or about an hour or so of publishing that episode, I received an email from a listener who said, okay, By shooting 73, you are no longer allowed to refer to yourself as a hacker anymore. (laughs) I get your point. But my feeling is, as long as I don't get to practice many hours every day, or even play every day, or that I still have a lot to learn from the variety of guests we have in the podcast, I'm still going to refer to myself as a hacker. But when someone asks me, if I'm a good golfer, I'll say, well, I'm not good, but I'm not that bad. But let me tell you something else. You've probably heard me ask how accurate somebody's index is if they play the same course over and over, especially club members. Case in point, I actually played in a charity tournament yesterday at Marin Country Club, where I've played about a half dozen times in the 10 years that I've lived here, and, you know, it's, it's the course right behind my house. And that course has no problem eating me alive. No matter how good I'm playing, it just wants to make sure that there it's in charge, not me. Uh, but over the weekend, I once again played out at Rooster Run, where I shot that 73, and have become very, very comfortable on that course and feel like it really lends itself to my game. Uh, So I understand the idea of playing the same course over and over again because your scores keep getting better. But on on Saturday's round, between the second and the sixth hole, I really struggled, including a triple bogey. Plus, I wasn't putting that well. I had 21 putts on the front nine. Ouch! Three putt, three putt, three putt. I was going nuts. But I I got it back together on uh, on the back nine. And I shot an even par 36. Only the second time I've done that. And the other time was during my 73. And I ended up with a 79 for the round. Again, the key for me on that back nine, I focused on deep breathing and tried to keep in mind a lot of what I've gathered from Jane's book, Connected Golf, and didn't let that bad front nine get me down. Uh, Once again, I'm going to go ahead and put a link to our guest's book, Connected Golf, Bridging the Gap Between Practice and Performance, and her website as well. It's Jane Story, S-T-O-R-E-Y, and that'll all be in today's show notes. If you have any questions, comments, suggestions for upcoming episodes, I'd love to hear from you. Please click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com.